Welcome to RD Investigations Rubber Ducky Video Channel. Welcome again to the RD Investigation Channel. Let me introduce myself. I am RD, and my goal is to help those that have been muted by the system by giving them a voice. For every wrongful conviction, there are those individuals that are victims of the judicial system whose lives have been stolen for a crime they did not commit. After case review, I begin to investigate the actual investigation, pre-trial and trial documents, evidentiary photos, and other information that is backed by source. I invite you to journey with me as we learn the true nature of the crime together. Not always are the individuals innocent, nor are they always guilty. In the United States District Court for the Western District of Texas San Antonio Division, Darley Lynn Rotier, Petitioner v. Douglas Dredke, Director, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, Institutional Division, responded. Petition for writ of habeas corpus by person in state custody. Introduction. Darley Lynn Routier sits on Texas death row for a crime she did not commit. On the morning of June 6, 1996, an intruder broke into Ms. Routier's household, where she slept on the living room couch. Her two oldest boys, Devin 6 and Damon 5, slept near her on the living room floor. Ms. Routier's husband, Darren, and their baby boy slept upstairs in the master bedroom. The intruder attacked Ms. Routier, Devin, and Damon brutally stabbed the two boys and sliced Ms. Routier's throat. Both Devin and Damon died as a result of their injuries. Ms. Routier survived, but the state charged her with her son's deaths. A jury convicted Ms. Routier of Damon's murder. After the prosecution, urged jurors to conclude from circumstantial evidence that she had murdered her own sons, inflicted her own wounds, and constructed an elaborately staged crime scene to make it appear as if a third party had broken in. Ms. Rotier has consistently maintained her innocence. Her conviction at trial turned on the state's presentation of circumstantial evidence, inaccurate expert testimony, and inflammatory character evidence that should not have been admitted. The evidence so infected Ms. Rotier's trial with unfairness as to deprive her of a right to due process. In addition, Ms. Rotier's trial counsel failed among other things, to conduct an investigation of her husband, the only other adult known to be in the house the morning of the murders, represented Ms. Rotier's husband in a separate gag order proceeding and then agreed not to implicate her husband in the defense of Ms. Rotier, and dismissed forensic experts Bart Epstein and Terry Labier after they reached preliminary conclusions that Ms. Rotier was innocent, and then failed to present any scientific expert in rebuttal of the state's circumstantial case. In Ms. Routier's state habits proceeding, she filed seven motions for access to forensic and biological evidence in the state's possession to support her innocent claim. The Texas court refused to hold any hearings and did not rule for over two years. The court finally denied Ms. Routier's attempts to gain access to this evidence when it denied her state habeas petition. The court engaged in no independent fact-finding and categorically endorsed the state's erroneous version of the facts. Thus, the state court's conclusions are entitled to no difference. Nor has the state court ruled on Ms. Routier's effort to obtain DNA testing under Texas law, filed in November 2003. Because these DNA proceedings are still pending, Ms. Rotier will ask this court to hold her petition in abeyance while she exhausts her remaining state court remedies. Ms. Rotier will also exercise her right to seek discovery in federal court. 2. Jurisdiction This court has subject matter jurisdiction of this case pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 2241-D. Ms. Rotier was indicted 
indicted for the offense of capital murder in the District Court of Dallas County, Texas. Venue was changed for trial to Kerr County, Texas, which is in the Western District of Texas San Antonio Division. Petitioner is in the custody of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice pursuant to the judgment and death sentence. Under 28 U.S.C. 2244 D1, a petition filed on or before December 1, 2005 is timely. 3. Statements of Facts In the early morning hours of June 6, 1996, six-year-old Devin Rotier and his five-year-old brother Damon were stabbed and killed in the living room of their home in Rollett, Texas. Devin and Damon's mother, Darlie Lynn Rotier, was seriously injured in the same brutal attack, suffering multiple knife wounds, including a cut across her neck that came within millimeters of fatally severing her carotid artery. The immediate aftermath of that assault is captured on the tape of Darlie's phone call to 911, which recorded Darlie's terrified voice, saying that an unknown intruder had stabbed her and her sons before exiting the garage. But the investigators who arrived at the house that night almost immediately decided it was Darlie herself who had murdered her children and that her near-fatal wounds were only part of an, e an effort to stage the crime scene. The police and later the prosecution never wavered from this snap judgment despite substantial and compelling evidence that an unidentified intruder had in fact been present at the time of the killings, including bloody fingerprints inside the house that do not match any member of the family as well as a sock bearing the blood and DNA of all three victims which was found three houses away in the alley behind the Rotier's home. A. The Attack Like many victims of violent crime, Darlie does not remember any details from the attack. Darlie, Devin, and Damon had fallen asleep in the family room where they had earlier been watching television. Darlie's husband, Darren Rutier, was sleeping upstairs in the couple's bedroom with their youngest son, eight-month-old Drake. As recounted in her trial testimony, Darlie recalls being awakened by Damon, hitting her right shoulder and saying, Mommy, then seeing a man walk from the family room couch into the kitchen. Darlie got up from the couch, then heard the sounds of breaking glass. Darlie motioned for Damon to stay behind her, then followed the man into the kitchen and saw him going into the utility room. Darlie turned on the lights in the kitchen, then realized there was blood on her. Walking further, she saw a knife laying on the floor inside the entrance of the utility room. Darlie picked up the knife and placed it on the kitchen counter, then saw that Devin had been stabbed and was lying motionless on the floor of the family room. Darlie screamed out Devin's name, then turned to see Damon, who was still standing. Seeing that Damon, too, had been stabbed, Darlie screamed out for her husband, Darren. Darren came downstairs and began trying to help Devin, performing CPR. Meanwhile, Darlie got towels from the kitchen to try and stop the boy's bleeding and grabbed the phone call to call 911. Darlie put a towel on Damon's back and told him to hold on, to which Damon responded with his final words, Okay, Mommy. Darlie then moved over to Devin, who was losing blood through his chest wounds every time Darren blew into his son's mouth. After placing another towel on top of Devin's chest wound, Darlie ran outside and screamed across the street for help from a neighbor who was a nurse, then ran back and forth to the kitchen sink for more towels to stop her son bleeding. All of this occurred while Darlie was on the phone with the 911 dispatcher. When the first police officer arrived at the scene, Darlie was dizzy and using a vacuum cleaner as a crutch to steady herself. Darlie had only realized that she had also been injured in the attack when she saw her neck wound in the mirror. Although she did not know how badly she had been wounded, the officer told Darlie to lie down. The paramedics then arrived at the scene and began tending to the two boys. The paramedics first took Damon away, then brought Darlie out to the front porch. After the paramedics bandaged Darlie's neck and arm wounds, they transported her to Baylor Hospital in Dallas, where she underwent surgery to explore and close the wounds. The surgery revealed that the slash wound across Darlie's throat had penetrated all the way to, but not through, the sheath of the carotid artery. Thus, if the wound had been only two millimeters longer, Darlie would have bled to death within two to three minutes. Darlie also suffered severe bruising on both arms that did not fully manifest itself until after the attack. Devin died at the scene. Damon 
was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Drake the infant, who had been sleeping upstairs with his father, is today 10 years old. Darley was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death. The Identity of the Assailant In front of the jury, the prosecution neatly summarized the central issue in the case as follows. The only issue is who did it identity, and it comes down to this. It's either going to be some unknown intruder who came into the house and committed a horrible murder, or it's going to be the defendant. Even before being taken to the hospital by the paramedics, Darley had described the man she saw leaving through the kitchen, whom she saw only from behind, as having long hair, wearing a baseball cap, a dark t-shirt, and jeans. The investigators quickly disregarded Darley's description of the attack. James Cron, a retired Rollette police officer who examined the crime scene that night, testified he formed a belief that there had been no intruder after his initial walkthrough of the scene, which lasted only 25 to 30 minutes. When asked by the prosecutor why he formed this opinion after his initial walkthrough, Cron amused that it's sort of a big picture. It's not only any one thing. It was the overall scene which primarily is a lack of evidence in many cases. But the entire scene indicated to me there had not been an intruder. There wasn't any one object or any one situation there. In accordance with this testimony, the state simply disregarded Darley's account and sought to portray the entire murder scene, as well as Darley's own injuries, as an elaborate attempt to stage the scene and cover up Darley's alleged responsibility for the deaths of her son trial. After jury selection, Darley's trial commenced in Kerrville, Texas on January 6, 1997, exactly seven months after the murders of Damon and Devin. The state's case against Darley was entirely circumstantial, built primarily upon character evidence that Darley was a materialistic woman who lived beyond her means and upon the testimony of so-called expert witnesses who testified that the physical evidence at the crime scene suggested that it had been staged. Indeed, the state sought to explain nearly every element of the chaotic, blood-soaked crime scene as evidence of staging, and therefore, Darley's guilt. The State's Staged Crime Scene Theory One of the key items of trial evidence was Darley's blood-soaked nightshirt, which she was wearing at the time of the attacks. Prosecution witness Tom Bevel testified that blood spatter on the back of the nightshirt was consistent with cast-off stains that would have been deposited when she brought the knife overhead in a stabbing motion. Taking a knife that was the same diameter of the knife in question, I just simply, in this case, I went down to my knee after placing a clean t-shirt on my body, put blood on the knife, on both sides, again, held it up and allowed it to just simply stop its dripping. And then just simply did a motion such as this. I think on the first time I did it with two swings, if you would, without adding any additional blood to see if, in fact, we get the blood that would be on the back that would be consistent in size, direction, location as the blood in question on the T-shirt worn by Darley on the night of the attack. He explained the significance of his findings to the jury by saying, I was able multiple times to get blood stains that were the same size, location, and long axis up and down in the area on other areas of the back of the t-shirt. Thus, the state sought to establish through Bevel's testimony a direct physical link between Darley and the stabbing of her children. But Bevel also conceded that the tiny stains he described as cast off on Darley's nightshirt which supposedly came off the knife when Darley was stabbing her children, contained the blood of both Darley and the boys. If Darley had stabbed her children, this mixture could only be explained in one of two ways. Either the knife itself had a mixture of Darley and her son's blood on it at the time she was stabbing her children, which was impossible under the state's theory of a staged crime scene and Darley's self-infliction of her own wounds after attacking the boys, or Millimeter-sized drops of Darley's own blood must have miraculously landed directly on top of the boy's own millimeter-sized drops of blood. Either explanation defeats the state's theory. 
Another key element of the state staging theory was a broken wine glass on the floor of the Routier kitchen in the middle of the intruder's exit path. Prosecution witness James Cron testified that a glass from a wine rack in the Routier's kitchen had been deliberately thrown to the floor to suggest a struggle. Question. While you were telling us what a rocket scientist could and couldn't do, let me just ask you how you decided that the wine glass was broken. When I make my... Walking through the kitchen the first time, I had no earthly idea. I thought, well, maybe it was broken during the scuffle with the intruder. After I finished the walkthrough and went outside and came back inside, it looked to me like it had been broken there to simulate or stage an offense. A member of the household broke it and planted it there. After I made the initial walkthrough, where I first went through, I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was broken maybe in a scuffle. After I went back outside the house, finishing all of the inside, going outside, then coming back in, I based my opinion that there was no intruder, and I could only conclude that the glass was broken as part of the staging of this offense to make it appear like there had been an intruder. Prosecution witness Tom Bevel testified that a Hoover vacuum cleaner that police officers discovered knocked over actually had been rolled through blood as indicated by wheel marks on the flooring, was another effort to stage a crime scene. Answer. It is a motion just simply of the wheel rolling through the blood stain. However, they are not connected. You then have another area, and you would just have to lift the vacuum cleaner and go over to another area and then proceed to roll again in a different direction from the original location or and original direction. Question. Okay, so there were differing directions to these movements. Is that right? Answer. As well as not being connected, so there has to be some movement up from off of the floor with the vacuum cleaner. Question. The roll marks that you saw on the floor, sir, were they consistent with the state's evidence number three just simply being dumped over or knocked over in one motion? Answer. They would not. No, sir. Another prosecution expert, Charles Lynch, testified that a single fiber recovered from knife number four, a bread knife that the state alleged Darley used to cut a window screen in the garage to make it appear an intruder had gone through the window, was consistent with the material from a torn garage window screen. Question. Bottom line, from this comparison of the black rubbery material and the glass rods on the window screen and on this knife, what does that say to you as a trace evidence analysis? Answer. I couldn't tell the difference between this debris and the debris found on the knife, and therefore this knife could have been used to cause the cut defect. In his closing arguments, the state explained how these witnesses' testimony of the stage crime scene supported the theory that Darley had murdered her sons. Well, it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out that this vacuum cleaner was dumped on top of those bloody footprints after it was moved. But why? If the defendant did it, it's because it's staging. You need to show some type of struggle occurred, something like that. But what else didn't make sense to Mr. Cron? The wine glass supposedly ran into this. This intruder ran into this wine rack somehow and broke a glass. Well, there's glass on top of the bloody footprints, and the officer said they were careful not to step on blood and did not step on glass. The trouble is, he checked the wine rack, and it was real sturdy. There is another indication that something wasn't adding up with the story. And when Charles Lynch testified the bread knife, he looked at it under the microscope. And what did he find? Glass rods, the same type of rubber material seen on the bread knife, and that same type of rubber debris with the glass meshed in it. The same type of stuff that happens when you cut the screen. And it adds up. The bread knife was used to cut the screen. And that tells you they were trying to fake the crime scene. And the defense asked Tom Bevel how Darley's blood could be mixed with the boy's blood on the tiny stains on her nightshirt. But the most consistent way it could happen is when the stab motion comes up and the knife is over the shoulder. He simulated it in tests and found the same size of the spot on his own t-shirt. That tells you that she was stabbing and Devin's blood winds up on her back. It's not going to wind up there if she is laying on the couch as a man wrestles at her neck. The prosecution even managed to incorporate a key piece of evidence found some 75 yards away from the Routier home into the staged crime scene theory that it crafted.
The item of evidence was a blood-stained sock found by the police in the alley several houses away from the Routier home, which contained the blood of both Damon and Devon, as well as a faint result of DNA from Darley and several unidentified limb hairs. The state's ex explanation for the location of the sock was simply that Darley must have planted it there as part of her staging of the crime scene after the boys had been stabbed. But since none of her blood was found anywhere between the Routier house and the location of the sock before she supposedly inflicted her own wounds. The state's theory was physically impossible, however, given the testimony of the state's pathologist that Damon could not have lived more than nine minutes after being stabbed. The 911 recording lasted 5 minutes and 44 seconds, and it was at least another 1 minute and 10 seconds before the paramedics saw Damon take his last breath. This would have left only 2 minutes and 6 seconds for Darley to, among other things, leave the house with the sock, wearing nothing but a nightshirt, run on concrete in her bare feet to the back gate, kick the broken gate open with her bare foot, run the length of 3 houses, drop the sock, return to the back gate, close the back gate, and enter the house. Pick up the butcher knife in her right hand, cut her throat, shoulder, and cheek without turning on a light. Switch the knife to her left hand and cut her right forearm and fingers of her right hand. Put the knife with her blood on it down on the carpet near the couch in the family room. Move the knife to the kitchen counter. Turn on the kitchen light, switch with the bloody hand. Rush to the utility room, touch the door to the garage with the bloody hand. Break a glass, wine glass, so that pieces of it landed on top of her blood. Grab the vacuum cleaner with a bloody hand. Roll it through her blood in the kitchen. Lift it off the floor and roll it through her blood again. Knock the vacuum over on top of her blood and the broken glass. Scream for Darren and wait for him to rush downstairs and pick up the telephone and dial 911. Thus, the only possible explanation for the presence of the sock in the alley was that it had been dropped there by a fleeing assailant. 